Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Radhika Kapoor, GR2 from Department of Radio Diagnosis, MM Institute of Medical Sciences and Research, Malana Ambala. And today I'm going to be talking about etiological findings in a case of mucormycosis. Introduction, rhinocerebral mucormycosis is an acute, febrile, and often fatal opportunistic infection that usually affects the diabetic or immunocompromised patients. It is caused by any member of mucoraceae family, including the Epsidia, mucor, and rhizopus. Clinically, the presenting symptoms are not specific. However, they may present with headache, low-grade fever, facial swelling, and or bital or paranasal sinus syndrome. After the infection of nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses, the fungi tend to cause necrotizing vasculitis, which quickly extends into deep face, the orbit, the cranial cavity, and the brain through the skull base, septa, and foramen. When the paranasal sinuses are involved, and it is limited to only the paranasal sinuses, the survival rate is 50 to 80 percent. However, in any case, where there is cerebral invasion, mortality is greater than 80%. We retrospectively reviewed the neuroimaging in the case of rhinocerebral mucormycosis into establishment of common radiographic patterns and predicting the diagnosis and the infection. Materials and method. MRI imaging with 1.5 Tesla weighted imaging system was done and T1 weighted images were obtained after IV injection of gadolinium contrast, 0.1 millimole per kg. CT scan was available for review. Images were evaluated for density, signal intensity, contrast enhancement characteristics. CT density was in assessed on unenhanced images and compared with that of muscle and brain. MRI signal intensity was compared with gray matter on T1 and T2 weighted images. Clinical information, the presentation, management, and the clinical history was obtained from the patient. On CT imaging, we could see involvement of bilateral maxillary sinus with soft tissue density in bilateral maxillary sinuses. There was also involvement of ethmoid and sweenoid sinuses. This is a sagittal image which shows involvement of the ethmoid sinuses. There was marked destruction and rarefraction of the medial maxillary walls. There was also rarefraction of the ethmoid sinus walls. Rarefraction basically means thinning of bones. There was thickening and fat stranding of the subcutaneous tissue. And on correlation with MRI, we could see tenting of left eyeball with bulky lateral rectus and retroorbital fat, which indicates the involvement of the orbit. On coronal sections, we could see rarefraction of the right inferior orbital wall, again indicating an orbital involvement. We could also see bilateral ostomiatal complexes were blocked of maxillary sinuses. And there was defect in the anterior nasal septum. Nasal septum perforation is one of the uh, characteristic features of ROCM. There was soft tissue enhancement in the retroantral space extending into the pterygopalatine fossa. To summarize CT findings, we could see marked soft tissue density in bilateral maxillary sinuses causing almost complete opacification, soft tissue density which is seen extending into the retroantral spaces, and the involvement of orbit in the form of tending of left lobe with surrounding fat stranding, thickening of extending into the subcutaneous tissue suggestive of orbital cellulitis. On MRI, we could see polypoidal mucosal hypertrophy in bilateral maxillary sinuses with air fluid level on the right side. We could also see polypoidal hypertrophy in the bilateral ethmoid and sphenoid sinuses. And on post-contrast images, we could see heterogeneous enhancement with multiple non-enhancing hypointense areas in the thickened mucosa. These areas represent necrosis and devitalization of the tissue. There was a positive black turbinate sign in the middle turbinate. The black turbinate sign refers to ischemia and on enhancement of the turbinates. And the middle turbinate is the most commonly involved. These are coronal images of post-contrast MRI. This is an axial image which shows non-enhancing left nasal mucosa, which again indicates the positive black turbinate sign. There is polypoidal mucosal hypertrophy in the nasopharynx. And there was polypoidal mucosal hypertrophy in the region of bilateral nasal sinuses with heterogeneous enhancement and hypointensities on left more than right. Heterogeneous soft tissue enhancement was also seen in the retroantral region, which indicates the deep neck involvement. It is an initial sign of involvement of deep neck space. Then there was also involvement of left, medial, and lateral pterygoid. This is a coronal image which shows the bulky lateral pterygoid. Then we talk about the uh, pterygopalatine fossa, which is a neurovascular crossroad. 
and infection spread from the nasal cavity via the pterygopalatine fossa. The pterygopalatine fossa is represented in red in this image, which is bounded by the maxilla pterygoid process with the access to adjacent spaces through spheropalatine foramen indicated in pink, median canal indicated in orange, foramen rotundum indicated in green, and pterygomaxillary fissure indicated in yellow. In our case, we could see mild enhancing soft tissue on the left pterygopalatine fossa. And this is the involvement of left orbit with guitar pick appearance of the left globe indicating raised IOP and severe orbital cellulitis. It is not indicative of mucormycosis, however, it indicates involvement of orbit in our case. There was bulky left extraocular muscle, which is a left, left lateral rectus. The earliest sign of globe involvement is thickening of the rectus muscle. Medial rectus is the most commonly involved. Since there is no enhancement of the optic nerve, therefore it rules out the possibility of optic neuritis, which is also a complication of rhinocerebral mucormycosis. Then we could also see proptosis on the left side. And due to spread through erosion in the cribriform plate, there was neuroparenchymal involvement, which is indicated by dutal enhancement on the left side. Cavernous sinus thrombosis is one of the complications of rhinocerebral mucormycosis. In our case, we could see bulky left cavernous sinus with small hypointense filling defect. There was a diffuse subcutaneous edema. To summarize the MRI findings, there was complicated bilateral maxillary ethmoid sphenoid sinusitis with rhinitis with soft tissue in bilateral retroventral region and intratemporal fossa left more than right with involvement of bilateral masseter spaces left more than right with left orbital cellulitis with left cavernous sinus thrombophobitis with dural thickening and enhancement along the left frontotemporal region. Discussion. Mucomycosis is an invasive fungal infection which is first described in 1885 by Paul Toff. Although it can affect different organs of the body, rhinocerebral form is the most common. These organisms can become pathogenic in immunocompromised patients as well as in those with poorly controlled diabetes mellitus and diabetic ketoacidosis. Organ transplantation, hematological malignancies, chronic corticosteroid treatment, hemochromatosis are also examples of immunocompromised states. Infection begins in the nasal cavity and it spreads through the paranasal sinuses. Early mold implantation is typically in the maxillary sinus where there is no bone breakdown. And then the middle turbinate is the most involved, common involved site. Imaging allows assessment of bone destruction followed by intracranial cavernous and interorbital extension. However, early radiological changes such as mucosal thickening are indistinguishable from non-specific sinusitis on MRI or CT. Therefore, high index of suspicion and early diagnosis are essential, especially in immunocompromised patients. Although CT or sinuses is preferred imaging modality because it is cheaper and more easily available, but the bone destruction is often seen late in the course of infection after soft tissue necrosis. MRI is often more sensitive for identifying intradural and intracranial extension of ROCM, thrombosis of cavernous sinus, thrombosis of cavernous part of internal carotid artery, angioinvasive nature of fungus, extranasal involvement, bone erosion spreading through small vascular channels. Conclusion, ROCM is a potentially fatal invasive fungal infection, particularly in immunocompromised patients. ROCM is characterized by various imaging abnormalities in CT and MRI, although it is not specific. Imaging aids in early suspicion or diagnosis in appropriate clinical settings, especially in immunocompromised patients and in determining the extent of involvement in complications. Early detection of ROCM and complications allows for appropriate treatment, which can reduce the cost of care, morbidity, and mortality. Thank you.